this is the um, class that we've been following. Today, duty ethics, or deontology, it's, as it's called. Deontology comes from um, the, 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 well, I'll get into that as we go along. Uh, deontology comes from words which mean duty or responsibility, um, the study of duty. Um, so next week we will talk about virtue ethics, which is the third way, uh, general way of making decisions. Last, last time we met, teleology or goals as a basis, you know, what is going to be the end goal we want to achieve. Today, duty or law ethics, what principles do we have that we should work under? And then next week, virtue ethics. What kind of person will it make us if we make uh, one decision versus another decision? You know, what kind of virtues do we want to have in ourselves? And then the conclusion. I do not have, as you probably figured out by now, the uh, what you need to know papers. Just was not possible to get them done with us being gone to San Antonio the last three days. Hello, little friend. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I will get them. I'll, I'll get them done probably this weekend. I uh, may try to email them out to you. If not, I don't think there's any reading the last week, is there? Did I intentionally leave that? I thought. I, 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 I need to go back and look. I, I think there is. Is there reading? A little bit. I knew there wasn't much because I intentionally thought I would leave you that last week. So even if you don't get the documents until next week. You'll have a week of not having a lot of other reading or studying, and this you know, it's only like eight pages of questions and answers, so it's not hard to study. Um, but I'll get it to you as quickly as I can. I apologize, I don't have them today, since I usually do try to have them in the fifth week of class. So our question is, of course, what is ethics or moral philosophy? This is the uh, approach to understanding what is the best way for people to live, or what actions are right or wrong in particular circumstances. That's what we mean when we talk about ethics. In practice, ethics is intended to help us answer the questions of human morality by defining good and evil, right and wrong, virtue and vice, crime and justice. I've dealt with this stuff before, but it helps us, I think, to, to look at some of these basics each week as we before we get into the, the meat of the thing. Um, Last time we met, I talked about the fact that there are some sort of common sense principles that seem to apply to ethical decision making. The idea that some things just seem obvious to us. One of them that I'm going to talk about briefly a little bit later is the principle of autonomy, that people should be allowed to be self-determining. You know, we don't have a right to take people's freedom away from them, even though people who come into power at various times in history consistently try to do that, to take power away from people to be self-determining. One of the principles of democratic society, especially, is that we believe that people have a right of self-determination, which includes the right to elect their leaders, not to be controlled by dictatorship. So this principle of autonomy, this also comes into play when we start talking about how we, what principles we can establish that will be the basis for us to make ethical decisions. Again, I'll talk about that later. Some of the others, principle of utility, which is really part of teleology, it's a goal ethics. How do you maximize pleasure and minimize pain? What's going to be the best good for the most people? Now you run into problems because you get into the question of, well, what's really good? Sometimes things, two things that both seem to be good are contradictory to one another. So how do you make that decision? Um, and best for whom? We have, there are always legal questions that come up in things like um, the right of eminent domain, if you know that expression. Eminent domain is a legal term that means that if a majority of people will be benefited by something, then it, it, it gives justification for limiting the freedom of one individual. For instance, the right of eminent domain gives the government a right to purchase at a fair price, but still to purchase property, even if the owner doesn't want to sell it, if it's necessary, for putting in a highway that will benefit everybody, or for some other public works kinds of thing. So um, this, these issues of um, principle of utility Maximizing good, uh, pleasure or good, minimizing pain or evil, but you get into the questions in teleology of, well, good for who? And you, you, what if it's not good for everybody? And how do you evaluate good versus best sometimes? And people have different opinions. You know, what's good for me and mine may not be what's good for you and yours, so who gets to decide? Then the principle of justice, that all people should be treated equally and fairly. The principle of sanctity of life, respect for that all human life is sacred. As we said when we first looked at this, 
you get into issues of conflict between, for instance, the principle of autonomy, that people should be allowed to be self-determining, versus the sanctity of life, the question of abortion. You know, how far does a woman have a right to say, I can do whatever I want with my body, versus the people who would say that, but that's, you know, what you want isn't as important as the human life that is inside you. And so you can see that you run into conflicts on those. If two or more of these ethical principles seem to be in conflict, how do we resolve it? That's why we need ethical theory. We need a framework for moral decision making. Goal ethics or teleological ethics is notoriously bad for giving us that, for the reasons I've just recited. That, that good for who? You know, how do you evaluate between goods? It doesn't give you always the, a clear answer. Um, and yet, teleology, goal ethics, tends to be what is dominant in our culture today, uh, doing the most good for the most people. Today we're talking about something that is actually older than that, and it, while it had gone out of vogue for a while, it, it has come back because of the realization that goal ethics, especially in modern times, with all of the, we have a whole new series of ethical quandaries that have come along because of technology. You know, what do we do with uh, stem cell experimentation? You all know about the situation where for experimentation, <coughs> experiment's sake, um, the, uh, oh, the Family Planning Organization, Planned, Planned Parenthood, Parenthood, was selling aborted infant fetuses and selling tissue from abortions. And it's been a huge ethical thing. And I, I, almost everybody has said, that's terrible. Well. That's an ethical question. And yet, they would say, well, and, and particularly because they have recordings of people talking about it in a very, you know, a very sort of flippant, materialistic, you know, how much money can we get in a way without the kind of regard and respect that they would have thought is necessary for human tissue. But stem cell research, cloning, um, uh, the, the technical aspects, the, the modern ideas, abortion is a very, very old thing, but like uh, partial term, uh, or partial birth abortions and things of that sort. All kinds of things that modern technology has created quandaries for us ethically. And how do we determine those things? As always, the question in ethics is not just what do I believe, it is what should I do? We can agree on what we believe and disagree on what we should do. So how do we create a system whereby we can think that way. Christian ethics comes into conversation with other kinds of thinking, particularly Greek philosophy, for instance, and others, um, in terms of determining ethical approaches. But in every case, whether you're talking about the ancient Greeks, whether you're talking about Hebrew ethics, modern Christian ethics, completely secular ethics, we're going to talk about Kantian ethics in a little while, um, you have three primary ways of approaching a moral decision. Now, there may be some slight combinations of these. I'm going to talk about proportionalism the end of the class, but teleology, which is goal-oriented, what goal do we want to accomplish and therefore what ethical decisions do we need to make to get there. There is deontological, which we're talking about today, which is duty or rule-oriented, and then next week we're going to talk about areteology. We don't usually use that word because it's, people don't know it as well, but virtue-oriented. What virtues do we want to encourage? Most people without thinking about it, will use some combination of these. They will set goals for their life, they will identify what duties they feel they have responsibility for, and other people may set duties for them too. You know, if, if, if you try to drive down you know, an American freeway at 120 miles an hour, the state police will inform you of the duties that you have violated, okay? There are laws, and those are duty, a kind of duty. And then also, what kind of person should I be? You know, what will it make me if I you know, if I go to this ball game instead of going to my best friend's birth, which I promised her six months ago, you know, every, every week since that I would be there when her baby's born, and yet I got tickets to this great game. Okay, what kind of person will it make me if I'd rather go to a football game than, than fulfill my promise to uh, my closest friend when she's having a baby? What kind of person am I going to be? The virtue ethics. Um, what we're looking for in every case is not just how do I make a particular decision? We're looking for a way of thinking that we can apply as we face new decisions that come down the road. So it's not just give me, you know, because we could always just flip a coin if it was always just a matter of this decision. In fact, some people do flip coins. Some people just simply appeal to authority. You know, they have a, they have a, uh, 
parent or a boss or a spouse, and they just say, what should I do? And whatever that, person, that authority says, they do it. So there are other ways. But the fact is, we, if we're being mature, we need to not just flip a coin and leave everything to chance. We need to not just have somebody else make the decision for us. We need to have some set of principles or some process or some system by which we have decided, here's how we're going to make decisions when ethical questions come along. What's going to guide us in general when we have to have a particular decision made, when we need to confront a specific situation? How does any particular ethical decision connect with all the other ethical decisions we have to make in our lives? Are we being consistent or are we all over the map? Deontology gets into that. Um, all of these questions are questions of moral decision making and everybody does it. Everybody makes decisions about ethical issues all the time. Am I going to sleep in or am I going to go to work? <laughs> all right? That's really an ethical decision because it's not just a matter of if I don't go to work they won't pay me. You've made a commitment. You know, you, there are people who have who you have made a promise you will be there to do the work that needs to be done so their business is going to survive. Um, you know, am I, am I going to go for two weeks without bathing and then still expect to be able to relate to people in society? Uh, there are, we make decisions all the time. And almost all of those, if you follow the logic, have some sort of impact on other people and on our place in the world. And so therefore they do become ethical decisions. Um, how much are, do we, next week we're going to talk about how much we believe that characteristics, personal characteristics like humility, generosity, honesty, and courage must be pursued. All right? Am, am I going to make, do the hard thing, the thing I don't really want to do, if I know that's being honest, or being generous, or being courageous, or being humble? I'm so proud of being humble, right? The idea is we have to have some principles that we can work from. Now, today, deontology. Deontology comes from the Greek word deon, which means what is necessary or right, what we have a duty toward. And then logos, which uh, frequently is translated as the study of something. It's more complicated than that in terms of the logos as, as used in the Greek New Testament. But generally, it means the study of. So deontology is the study of what is right or necessary, what responsibilities we have. And that's what, what we're going to get into today. Okay? Any questions about that before we get into the new stuff? This is all premise, preface for where we're going. We good? Mm -hmm. All right. Deontology, following the rules. Uh, deontological or duty ethics says that moral thinking is about the use of reason to identify duties and apply them in particular situations. Now you'll notice it's not appealing to some other authority, it's using our own reason. Using what resources we have in us to decide what rules should I follow, what responsibilities do I have. In fact, the deontological ethics is always talking about rights and responsibilities. Someone's rights, and then the responsibility someone else ha has to respect or address those rights. Um, and everybody would agree that if a person is starving, it is right, they have a right to eat. People should not starve to death. But the ethological et uh, ethics would say, but who has the responsibility, the duty to feed them? Do we? Do the people who are in charge of the government of the country that they live in? You know, so, but the ethological ethics is always about... Um, rights and responsibilities. Not just what will turn out best, but particularly when I'm doing deontological ethics, what is my duty or my responsibility in this situation? When I hear that someone is going hungry, do I have a duty to do something about that? A responsibility. There's a cat in our... Uh, we don't know who it belongs to, we don't know where it came from, we don't know who it belongs to anybody, but it's been hanging around our house. In fact, when when our other dog was alive, we'd have, we'd have food in the kitchen, and this cat, he's a bold little critter, he or she, I don't know which, would come in the kitchen and eat the food. Even if, like, Carolyn has been working at the sink and turned around, and the cat is like eight feet away from her eating this food because he was hungry. Well, you know, because our dog was sick, we, we had to keep shooing it off because if our dog had seen it, he would have, he would have freaked because he does, you know, he, high prey drive, and he would have chased the cat, and that would have been really bad for him in the condition he was in. So we kept shooing the cat away. 
But as soon as our dog was gone, um, I bought cat food and we've been feeding the cat, right? And now he will show up this morning. I came down at 5.30 in the morning and he's sitting on a place on the mat in our, right outside our back door just waiting for me to get up so he can get some food. Well, do I have a duty to feed a hungry animal? I think I do. No matter what you think, Pilar. I think I do. I, I think that, that for the sake of a humanitarian, you know, not only to people but also to, to animals, that I have a responsibility to care for their needs um, and not just let them go hungry. So how do we decide? What is my duty? What is my responsibility? Clearly Pilar doesn't agree with me. She doesn't think that it's a moral responsibility to feed hungry animals. I know you're very allergic. Uh, that's right. But your reaction was, no! <laughs> so that's why I said that. Um, but we have to decide. What is my duty or my responsibility given the circumstance? Is there a problem? No, it's Samuel Cole. Okay. I don't know when. Uh, I know. Um, uh, yeah, they were working on something. So, okay. So, a duty, as when we talk about deontological or duty ethics, a duty can be a law, a rule, a social convention, or simply some inherent sense of what is right or what is required. Using the cat analogy, I, there's no law or rule or social convention that requires me to do that. But I have a feeling that if there is a hungry animal hanging around my house, I don't want it to suffer. And so I will do what I can to try to help it. When we get these puppies, it's going to be fascinating to see how that works. <laughs> because the cat's... Well, but the cat's not friendly to us. I mean, when, I, when we try to approach it, it hisses at us. So it's not like this cat has, you know, the cat will come in our house, but... We, if we try to approach it, it runs away, but I, it, it's struggling because it will sit down. Like at one point, it walked past the food and sat down in the kitchen just to look at me. So I sit down on the floor and just watch it for a while and talk to it. But it still won't let us approach it, okay? Well, there's no rule or law or convention even that says I have to do that, but I have a feel, I have a sense that I should be doing something to help because clearly he's not well fed. So it can be a whole series of different kinds of things. And whereas goals inherently tend to conflict, that we find competing goods, even in Christian ethics, we find various kinds of good that seems to conflict with one another. And, you know, we can, it, Augustine acknowledged that. Augustine was kind of goal-oriented in his, in his ethics. He did a little bit of everything because Augustine was that good. But he recognized the fact that when you're talking about goals, it takes a, a lot. Augustine said it takes a lifetime of maturing enough till you can make good decisions about which teleological ethical goals you see you should be pursuing. <coughs> but we don't have a lifetime sometimes. You know, we these things come up all the time and we have to have some way to approaching them. We've talked about utilitarianism, the most good for the most people. But as we've said, you run into all kinds of problems with that. People um, have often in fact, we always keep coming around to deontological ethics. We keep coming back around to what rules should I follow? What duties do I have? What responsibilities are, are impinge upon me, have, have a right to make a claim on my time? Um, and people have a general sense, at least to a certain extent, people have a general sense, it seems, that, that they do have duties and what those duties are, even though situations can be confusing. If there is a, if you come upon a lost, hungry child in the street, do you just go, go away, kid? No. No, you don't. You have a sense that you have some sort of social responsibility, some duty to care for that child, to try to find the child's parents, to do something to help in that situation. And just because, you know, your, a friend is expecting you for lunch right now, doesn't mean you just blow this child off in order to go have lunch. There is an inherent sense that all people have that we have certain duties. Now, it's always also been understood that, and the Stoics said this, the, uh, the Greek philosophers of the Stoics, they said that if you follow this kind of duty that we all have a sense of, if you accept the responsibilities that we have, a, that generally speaking, we all have a pretty consistent idea of responsibilities. If you follow those, you're probably not going to be rich or particularly successful. So, so I have a question. Yes. An inherent sense we're born with that, or is that nurture versus nature? Well, it, it, people have disagreed with that. Most people who have studied this down through the years, and I'm going to talk about them oh. uh, some, like, like Thomas Aquinas, for instance, says that there is a natural law 
that is is part of who all people are as made in the image of God, and that it is inherent, that we don't just learn this, and that it is, um, that there may be a gray area around the edges that different cultures or societies have varied on. Uh, as I've said before, the idea that, um, you know, people say, well, they're cannibal uh, societies that say it's okay to eat people. But there's never been a cannibal society that said it was okay to eat your own children. Okay. There's, even though there, there's some areas that we, not everybody might agree on some of the particulars, there still are basic things that, yes, it's okay to go to war against the, against the other tribe, but it's not okay to go to war against your own tribe unless you are seriously <laughs> provoked. So there's, there is sort of this natural sense, no matter what the culture, no matter how advanced or primitive we might identify the culture as, people seem to have some sense that we need to, you know, that we have certain duties and responsibilities. In fact, so much so, um, I don't know if I said this in this class, but we talked about it in one another class, that we have a, a scientific name for somebody who does not have a sense of responsibility for others. It's called, you know, the, they're sociopaths. It's considered a mental illness if we have no sense of responsibility for the well-being of anybody else, if it's all just about us. So there is this inherent sense, I think, the idea of, you know, do the right thing. Okay, if nothing else, do the right thing. The founders, was it, um, of Google? You know, their mission statement, is Google or Facebook? I don't remember. Um, their, their mission statement when they started was do, uh, do no evil. That's their mission statement as an organization. They've been very successful, but the idea of do no evil, I think it was Google, uh, and because they got into the question of, well, you know, Google seemed to be working with the government of China to suppress some of the, some of the stuff, the, the freedom of the internet in that part of the world, and so they're going, wait a minute, you're doing evil. You're violating your own principle. But whenever you say do the right thing, or don't do evil, or et cetera, th things like that, that expresses sort of an inherent sense that there are right things and wrong things, and we all have a pretty good idea about that. Um, in fact, when we run into that, the, a failure on the part of people to be able to recognize that, I at least, and I think most people, find that very frustrating when people don't seem to have the, enough of the inherent sense of what of the, that there is right and wrong. I'll give you a specific example. Um, Carolyn and I were at dinner with two other couples one time, several, two or three years ago. This was right as the government of the United States was beginning to institute the various uh, programs to figure out if American citizens were hiding money in other countries so that they're not paying taxes on them, okay? Right now, you have to, if you have over $10,000 in foreign investments or whatever, you have to file certain paperwork, and they were just beginning that. Well, at this dinner, one of the couples was from our church, and one couple don't, uh, is not from our church, and the other man and uh, the other two men and I were talking, and one of them said, you know, um, well, I'm not worried about that because they'll never catch me. And the other guy and I said, yeah, but you are breaking the law. He said, well, it doesn't matter. They'll never catch me. <laughs> Over the next hour and a half, the other man from our church and I and the three women were having a different conversation, but we were talking, and the two of us kept trying to make this guy understand that whether you get caught or not, is not the only criteria for making a decision. Some things are right and some things are wrong. You decide to either you know, obey the law or break the law. And if you decide sort of frivolously, I'm going to break the law, then how far does that take you? It's a little bit of virtue ethics too. But at a certain point, the law is there for our protection as well as, you know, our protection against others as well as the protection of others against us. But the frustrating part, and I finally had to turn and talk to the women at the table because I couldn't stand it anymore because this guy's reaction was always, but that doesn't matter because they can't catch me. We, we could not find a way to have him understand that doing the right thing is not entirely based upon whether or not you're going to get punished for doing the wrong thing. And the frustration that the, the two of us experienced, and the guy never did figure it out, uh, that, that there was an issue there, is over the fact that anytime we run into anybody that doesn't have some sense that, that it's not just a matter of our, am I going to be punished if I do the wrong thing, sometimes you need to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And, and it, doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you agree with the government, government of the U.S. taxing us. I mean, the, the particulars of it had nothing to do with it. We got past that immediately. The question of, 
Do you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do? Do you obey the law because there is the law and it's in all of our best interest to obey the law or, or chaos would ensue? Um, the, the inability for somebody to be able to either understand that or acknowledge it is very frustrating to us, right? That comes down to this issue of we all have rules. We all have duties that we, um, that we understand and that we assume with regard to how we live our lives. And what that means is it boils down to, in deontological ethics, an action is right if it conforms to our duty. Right? So right and wrong is determined by whether or not it fulfills our appropriate duty. Now, what makes a person good is that he or she does right actions according to established duties and rules. Now, you, there is a legitimate question to be asked, and I'm going to get into that sort of thing a little bit later. Um, and how do you determine whether or not the established duties and rules are, are proper? You know, the defense of the Nazis, uh, some of the ones who did the terrible crimes in, in the Second World War was, I was obeying orders. I was, I was doing my duty as a soldier. Well, we have in recent times, in fact, the, the Second World War and the Holocaust especially, the, the atrocities that came in the middle and latter half of the 20th century, especially by the Nazis, but by others as well, has really raised a whole new set of ideas that there are higher duties. The, the very idea, you, you know, you've all heard that you know, the International Tribunal at The Hague, um, they try criminals for crimes against humanity. The very idea of crimes against humanity did not exist until the Second World War. That's not to say there were never crimes against humanity, but think about what that means. When, when we, as, a, as sort of a global community, when we just started deciding in response to the Nazis in the Second World War and what they did, the fact they said, I was just doing my duty, they said, oh, wait a minute. There is a duty bigger than that. There, you have a duty, a responsibility, to not do atrocities, to not commit crimes against humanity. And those are defined fairly specifically. But in other words, rather than say, well, duty ethics doesn't hold because the Nazis said, I was just doing my duty, we say, no, wait a minute. You were doing a lesser duty. There is a bigger duty that trumps that, and that is you do not commit atrocities against other human beings. You do not um, commit crimes against humanity. So in effect, duty ethics or deontology got reaffirmed at the Second World War because of the Holocaust and then other genocidal kinds of things that happened in the latter part of the 20th century. But this idea, the, the terminology, crimes against humanity, and the idea that there's a global court that tries to address that is a very new kind of idea, but it's entirely based upon duty ethics, that we have a duty to not oppress or uh, commit crimes against humanity as a whole. Now, some duties, as I said earlier, are um, imposed on us. Government laws and regulations, that's criminal laws, traffic laws, health regulations, you run a restaurant, the, in most places the government will come in and tell you, no, you have to close, we're gonna close you down because you're not meeting the regulations. You are not fulfilling your duty for somebody who's going to be serving food. If you join a country club, they will have there's a dress code. There are uh, expectations. You know, you're not allowed to get drunk on the property. You know, you're not allowed to scream profanities in the dining room. There, there are all kinds of rules that get imposed on us because of our participation in various parts of society, either as a citizen of a country, of a visitor to a place, of a member of a club or society. If you if you attend a private school, you almost certainly have an honor code that if you're caught cheating on exams, you get expelled. Those are the kinds of duties and responsibilities, deontological ethics, that get imposed on us from outside. But there's also a sense in which there are self-imposed expectations that do the right thing. Don't do evil. You know, I'm not going to do that because that would be dishonest, even if I'm not going to get caught. That's wrong. Um, our old pastor in Seattle, Earl Palmer, he said that one of the things he was most proud of and his, and his kids as they were growing up is when they, from time to time, and they would tell him later, they would get confronted with, you know, somebody would offer them drugs. Or they would say, let's, let's go in this shop and steal something. And they would say, no, 
My family doesn't do that. And Earl Palmer used to say, nothing made him prouder than that, to realize that they had a sense that they belonged to a family where they agreed there were certain duties, certain responsibilities, certain rules that they followed. They did not violate because of their membership in that particular family, and especially because they're Christians. Okay? Um, not, the issue wasn't whether they get caught or not. The issue wasn't whether it was profitable or not. The issue was, we don't do that. Those are self-imposed kinds of duties and responsibilities. I'm going to talk a little bit later about Immanuel Kant. Um, Kant came up with an ethical theory called the categorical imperative, in which he said all true morality is self-imposed, and it is all based upon what is rational. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, Kant is one of the most significant people who's, who's addressed that. It's also true, yes? How does the Crusades figure in on something like this? Um, the Crusades were justified. Let me start there. If you've attended any of my lectures, the Crusades were, at the start at least, a war of defense. They were as justified as any war has ever been. That doesn't mean there weren't terrible things that were done on both sides. So we can't, the, uh, the sense I had, Rick, from your question is the Crusades were all awful and wrong. Uh, well, they weren't, okay? Um, I could show you some maps to show you why that was the case, because the Islamic armies had invaded the Iberian Peninsula and gotten up almost to Paris in France. They had taken over all of Christian North Africa, all of the Christian, Christian and Jewish Middle East, all of Christian Asia Minor, where Paul planted all those churches, had come under Muslim rule. And they were at the, on the gates of Constantinople, ready to take over what had been the capital of the Christian world for a long time, before the Crusades started, and they, they fought back. Again, it's not to say that there were terrible things, and noble things too, done on both sides. But we can't pick an instance like that and say, oh, well, there's no, you know. The, in fact, um, from a duty ethics point of view, the Crusades started when the Pope, at that point, uh, declared at the Council of Clermont, um, we've gotten a request from the, the emperor and the, um, and the religious head, the metropolitan in Constantinople. They're being attacked by Muslim armies. They've asked us to respond, and we must respond because Deus vult, which means God wills it. The idea that there is a duty, we have a responsibility to respond. To protect Christianity, to protect you know, Christians against Islamic uh, onslaught, etc. For a good example of duty ethics, you know, of a deontological sense, we have a responsibility. Now, it ended up being much bigger than, than either the people in Constantinople, um, Byzantium Constantinople expected, and bigger than the Pope expected when he made that call. That's history. But um, there are, I mean, there are people who say, we're doing this because we have a duty. Well, if you dig down, you realize that it's entirely selfishly motivated because I want my people to win. In fact, one of the, one of the ethical challenges that has come to this um, is how do you decide which duties are right? How do you decide which duty is the primary one? And the philosophers on that issue have said that Whenever we, f we feel or identify that we have a duty to something, we need to ask, is this a basic duty or is it a prima, a prima facie duty? Meaning, is it on the surface? Prima facie, on the face of it. And they said, the, the issue is, make sure that it's not a prima facie duty, meaning it just looks like a duty on the face of it. And the way you do that is by asking, well, what is the more foundational duty underneath that? Okay. And if you dig down, you may say, I don't really have a duty at all. It's just that somebody has tried to convince me that I need to go to war in order to make my tribe richer or make my family more important or whatever it is. But if it really is because an evil has been done then or is being done and we need to address that, we need to stop that, then maybe you should go to war. Maybe that. So the issue is you don't take the, the surface duty, the prima facie duty. You have to say, what is the more fundamental or foundational responsibility or duty that, that is underneath that? And that's the duty you have an obligation to. And if you dig down and you say, well, no, there really isn't any kind of foundational. If I dig down, I realize that this isn't justified at all, then that's how you make the ethical decision. Does that make sense? So, not sometimes what looks like a duty on the surface, the prima facie duty, we have to go beneath that. What is under this? What's supporting 
really supporting this. Yes. So I'm, I'm a little confused about how a soldier can stay on the field. Yes. I mean, they have a duty up the ranks. Right. Have a duty to their lately to their fellow soldiers, <coughs> but they're sent to a war that they, they disagree with. I mean, how do they how do they rationalize that? Right. It's a difficult thing, I would imagine. Yes. How does uh, you're exactly right. Uh, when a soldier signs on in the military, they agree that they're going to obey orders, yeah. and the soldier does not decide what war they're going to participate in. No. The authorities do. Yes. Well, there's an onus on the authorities, on the government. You know, that's one of the reasons, for instance, why in most, most Western countries, at least, most countries, most Western countries especially, it's not the military that decides who goes to war and when they go to war. It's the civilian authorities. You know, we, we forget that. In most times in history, earlier in history, the armies decided when they were going to go to war. And they could have all sorts of, com you know, conflicting or wrong motivations because they wanted to win the battles, and, and particularly because they used to get, you know, they used to, get the benefit of whatever they conquered. You know, they would loot as a part of the process. We don't do that anymore, and the army doesn't get to decide what wars we go to. There are civilian authorities. But still, a soldier who joins the military, uh, this is one of the, one of the challenges always about, um, about required enlistment or the draft. If you're forcing people to join, you're not giving them a choice as to whether or not they even believe in war at all. Well, that's why in most Western uh, cultures, we have had things like conscientious objectors. You do, if you follow the rules, there's a means to get out of it. Or non-combat kind of roles. You know, conscientious objectors frequently are, are you know, their role is limited to um, working in the mess tent or in offices or you know, providing, you know, stretcher bearers and that sort of thing. So that they're not actually involved in active warfare. So there's always been, you know, almost always been in the West some allowance for that sort of thing. Conscientious objectors, I mean, obviously during the Vietnam War when there was so much objection, the military started cracking down and said, no, people can't say, I'm not going to, to you know, I, I'm not going to be drafted, I'm not going to join the military. And they were, they were not allowing as many conscientious objector statuses as were asked. That's why we got Americans going to Canada, you know. Um, and the Canadian government was saying, they, they, they didn't approve the Vietnam War, they were saying, you can't come and get them, we're not going to extradite them, right? So that has always been the question. Now, the thing that the, the again, in the last seven, 60, 65, 70 years that we've decided is even a soldier serving in the military, there is a higher level of duty that, that is the responsibility to not do atrocities. Okay? Saying, well, I was a soldier and I had to do my duty and they ordered me to do it, so I had to do it. That's the crimes against humanity thing. That's no longer, it's, the assumption is that yes, you have a duty to be obedient if you're a soldier. You have a duty to do what the authorities in the military tell you, and the military has a responsibility to do what the civilian authorities tell them. But at a certain point, if they're telling you to do something that is clearly uh, an atrocity, clearly is a violation of human rights to kill civilians or whatever it is, then you have a responsibility to say no. If you don't say no, now if you say no, they could execute you. But if you say yes, then later on you can be charged and executed. So it's, a, it's not easy. No. It's a very difficult situation. So. But that's why we don't, you know, that, that uh, required service in the military is, is not typical in the West unless the time of a very serious yeah. warfare. I mean, okay, we don't usually, the draft is not an ordinary thing, only in, in exceptional times. So the, all of those are, are efforts sort of that the society has to try to hedge their bets on that. The, with the realization that somebody who's serving in the military who is asked to do something that they consider to be unethical, they are in a quandary and they have to decide. Um, but ethical decision making is part of the human process. I'm not saying that's easy, but that's one of the reasons why if somebody thinks they're going to find themselves in a difficulty fighting a war that they're told to fight, they don't have to join anymore. Yes? The, the combat soldier is, isn't usually fighting for patriotic reasons. He's, he's fighting for survival of him and his buddies, and he does it, his primary duty is to his buddies. Right. Really? Very, very few flag wavers in the, the foxholes. Well, it's it, the, the <coughs> there's a difference in the sort of uh, the pr the <coughs> primary motivation for being there, and then the motivation you have once you get there. Mm -hmm. It's true that most you know most people who are in an active military service, meaning in in combat. They will say, you know, well, what's your motivation for doing this? And go, well, if I don't, you know, my, my, the guys on my right and left who are my friends, you know, closer than a brother, as they would call them, 
fact, we have all these expressions like the band of brothers, you know, the TV series. Uh, the idea that when you fight along somebody, somebody in a war, they do become closer to you than a brother. And so the, motiva the, the immediate motivation, the duty that you feel right then, is not, is not the higher level duty of, well, should I be involved in a war? It's, I have to fight because if I don't, then those I love on my right and left are going to suffer for it. I have a responsibility. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's complicated. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. If it was easy, then we wouldn't even have classes on ethics. But that the, you know, somebody who joins the military, that there is a challenge in that. John, um, as, as a Christian and as an individual, this issue of duty, and I think sometimes we can get lost in trying to decide which duty is correct. But maybe one of the serious issues is, am I willing to suffer the consequences for choosing the higher duty? Right. You know, and, and, and we may hide behind the argument that makes it a higher duty when actually it's very clear to us and our reticence is because uh, we're probably willing to pay the consequences for doing the correct thing. Exactly. And think about that. That's the difference between duty or deontological ethics and goal ethics. If, if I don't want to do this because of what might result, that's a relying on, a, one, on what are the goals, you know, what are the results going to be? That's the goal orientation. That's a teleological argument. Versus saying, this almost certainly is going to hurt, but I'm going to do it anyway because this is the right thing. You know, I have a duty to this. I'll give you a specific example that I experienced. I went to work as a senior manager in a company. It's actually a Christian company. Um, and people who were there see this video, they'll know what I'm talking about. And there was a woman who worked for me when I went in. I went in as, a, as, a, as the senior manager, as a senior manager, and uh, reporting to the president. And there was a woman who worked for me. And she was very difficult. And she had been verbally abusive to a number of people in the company. There were people who would, who would go the other way when they saw her coming. And she had been written up, her personnel file was like that thick. Several times she had done things that would, should have gotten her fired for cause. For cause means she's done something that disqualifies her for employment. Um, but she was black and she was a woman. And for that reason, nobody was willing to fire her. And I had a situation with her working for me where she and another manager that worked for me, uh, I was gone for a day um, and at a conference meetings. I come back and everybody's going, Wow, you're not going to believe it. But these two people, this man and woman manager, were screaming at each other in the hallway. And almost everybody could hear them. And the guy who was screaming at her was because she had been, uh, she had been so loud and critical about somebody who worked for him that the, the young woman was crying. So I... Um, so I get back and I, I sit down with him and, I, and it was going to become he said, she said. So I said, okay, you guys can calm down because you don't need to say a thing. I will tell you, I'm going to do all the talking and I'll tell you what. Rather than have you guys try to explain to me why you were justified in screaming at each other, I will just say that if either of you ever raises your voice again against anybody in this company, for any reason, I don't care what it is, you're fired. Simple as that. And then I said, would you like some tea? Because I was making tea. Well, I had people say, you can't fire her. She'll sue the company, the ministry. And I said, I don't care. You should never not do the right thing because of what you're afraid might happen. Right? Two months later, I'm in my office. And we were in this, this old house, was our office, and the oak door is about that thick. And I heard her screaming at my assistant out, out in the outer office. And I went to the door and said, come in, please. And she sat down. I said, do you remember two months ago when I told you if you ever raised your voice against somebody in this organization again, you were fired? I said, she said, well, yeah. And I said, I just heard you screaming at my assistant. She said, I wasn't screaming. We're friends. Everything was fine. I went, I heard you through a two-inch thick oak door. You're fired. And she looked at me and said, you can't fire me. I said, I just did. <laughs> okay? And... I walked over to the president's office and told him what we're going to do, and you know we together called personnel, and they said, "Oh wow, well, we're going to have to deal with you." She should have been fired several times before that. Several times she had people in tears over her verbal abuse, 
And it turned out later, I found out, that personnel went back and, and changed her file from being fired for cause to resigning. That was wrong. She should have been let go. I, and I was very respectful all the way along the line. Um, and yet, there's a case where the teleological, the goal-oriented thing is you can't fire her because of what might happen. No, that was not the right thing to do. Okay? There's a very specific example in my own life where you do what's right, what you have a responsibility for, what you have a duty for, not just do what's going to keep you from having a problem. Okay? That's why this is hard. But if I had been using an entirely teleological sort of view, you know, uh, what's the negative consequence that I want to avoid here? What's the goal that I want? You know, and that is not to get the company sued. Then I would have said, well, don't do that anymore. I know this is like the fourth or fifth time you've done this, but don't do it anymore. Okay? No. That would have been wrong. Is she sued? No. But that's because they changed her file. Later on, somebody else I know, they were looking to hire somebody in an organization that he was on the board of. And he came to me and said, do you know anything about this woman? And I said, and they were getting ready to hire her at a senior level. And I said, ah, don't do it. I said, I'm not going to get any details, but that would be a bad choice on your part. Because I, I, likewise, I felt a duty, a responsibility. This person who was a good friend of mine who was on the board and it was another Christian organization and they were doing really good work and she could have been dis enormously destructive. I didn't spend an hour talking about all the, you know, tor her terrible, terrible things she'd done. But, you know, did somebody have their hand up? Oh, Grace. So did she and personnel make this deal that she I, was resigning? I don't know. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> so, but again, do we make our decisions based upon what what we think might be the outcome. Now remember, one of the dangers of teleological, that is goal, making ethical decisions based upon what might happen, is we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know for sure. And so we're, we're trying to predict the future. Whereas if, I'm, if I know there are things that are right, there are things that are wrong, I have a responsibility to do what is right and not do what is wrong, then I have a clearer guide. Yes, Marvin. Well, and you need to consider, too, the harm that she's doing to the people that she's causing to cry and perhaps quit and lose their job and so on and so forth. It's like, other too. Exactly. You know, there's mm, mm, far greater downsides that I thought. That's why I felt like there was a responsibility. Yes. So we're, we're talking about what's going on in the you know, modern world right now, and you look at the case of Kim Davis, who was the clerk in the, the court in uh, Kentucky. Right. That she had a sense that she had a higher authority, but the government was insistent that she do her job. Right. And so there is a lot of dilemma in communities right now. Right. right. Those kinds of issues. Right. And that's that's a case where I could I could argue either side of that. Of course. You know. Of course. My own inclination is that she she has a conflict of duties. Yeah. Um, she feels that she has a duty to do what God would want her to do. Should we explain who she is in case? Yeah, Kim Davis is the woman in Kentucky, the, the county clerk that refused to issue licenses for, uh, for gay and lesbian couples to be married. And she was sent to jail for a while. But the issue there is she has conflicting mm -hmm. duties. On the one hand, she is employed by the government, and the government says this is the policy we're going to follow. And to what extent is, does she have a duty to obey that? She feels that as a Christian, she has a duty to be obedient to God and not issue those licenses. Okay, And so, which duty is she obligated to? Um, I think, to me, that, that would be similar to an issue of somebody who is a soldier, for instance, um, or somebody who's considering joining the military. If they join the military, then there is, apart from atrocities, apart from extreme cases, they're, they're accepting the duty and responsibility to be obedient to authority, mm -hmm. to do the job that they're being paid to do. And they're not the ones who decide what all's involved in that job. Okay, somebody else has the, that responsibility. Versus, you know, if, I'm, if I don't want to obey orders, if I don't want to do that, then I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't take that job. Well, you know, my sense is that she needs to be very vocal in saying, this is what I believe, this is what I think is right. But that doesn't mean she necessarily should stay in a job that she feels she can't fulfill the obligations of that job any longer. 
because she has, she has to decide a conflict of duties. Um, we, Caroline had a good friend who became a nun, and she was in a fairly liberal you know, nun order. <clears throat> and every time we saw her, she was complaining about how stupid the Pope was, and how <laughs> none of the authorities in the church, you know, and how her mother superior was a moron, and she didn't want to do this, and she didn't want to do that, and she didn't know why she couldn't, you know, do this. and, and Carolyn and I would sort of look at her and then look at each other and we would say, then why did you become a nun? Is that not sort of part of the deal? That you accept authority in that regard? And so, how do we apply those kinds of things to the Ken Davis issue or others? Okay? It's tough. Yeah, it is. Now, when we talk about rules, then we particularly as Christians, um, and for Jews as well, we start out with lots of duties and rules that are kind of built into the system for us. First, there is obviously the Ten Commandments, the Hebrew set of duties or responsibilities or rules. Now, there are more than just Ten Commandments. People don't get that. There are actually 613 mitzvot, which is the Hebrew word for commandments, in the Old Testament. They are rules. They are duties that God has told his people they have to be obedient to. Um, I've mentioned before the book, A Year of Living Biblically, which I still haven't read, but I've read a lot about it and got interviewed about it. He decided as a Jewish man, he was going to try to spend one year and do everything that was commanded in the Old Testament. And it got quite, quite funny, all right? You know, how do you end up stoning a sinner? You know, pebbles <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and so it became quite the experience for him. But And so we still, we run into questions as to how do we... For a Jew, how do you obey to that? And then for us, we've talked about the difference in, in moral law and uh, Deuteronomical or priestly law, that we are still obligated to follow the moral law. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie about your neighbor, don't, don't, don't covet their stuff, you know? Um, but we are not obligated to follow the Deuteronomical or priestly law. It's okay for us to eat bacon. It's okay, we don't have to sacrifice animals, etc. But it's not just the Hebrew rules that are impinging on us as duties, as Christians. We also have Jesus. Jesus was asked at one point, as you know, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, the first and greatest commandment is, and interestingly, he quotes Deuteronomy here, the Old Testament. He says, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, you know, he gave him a bonus, more than they asked for. The second greatest commandment is like unto it, right up against it, right next to it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two commandments to love. And so those are impinging upon us. First to love God and then to love our neighbor. The Martin Luther famously said, Augustine had a version of this, but Martin Luther said it clear more clearly, love God and do as you please. Now what that means is if you get that in the right order, if you really love God, then the things that are really pleasing to you will be the things that are pleasing to God. That is, that's basically a deontological ethic. Love God, obey that commandment, that rule, accept that duty on yourself, and then do as you please, because if you truly are living by that first duty, everything else will fall in line. Okay? Um, but in addition, to the Hebrew laws, for those of us who are uh, <clears throat> Christians, the, the ethical laws of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the laws of love in the New Testament, we're also told to obey the authorities in the world. 1 Peter 2, 13, 14, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. By that he means those who have been put in authority over us in a society. Whether to emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right, we are told to obey the law. And Paul talks about this too. Paul, who was persecuted, and eventually both Peter, who wrote this, and Paul, were executed by the authorities that they said we needed to be obedient to. So we start out with that deontological requirement, that we be obedient but then we have to figure out, what, what if we run into conflict? You know, what, I'm, a, I'm a supposed to obey the authorities. I have been drafted or I enlisted as a soldier. They're asking me to do something I think violates a higher duty than that. How do I respond? It ain't easy. 
But the question is, how do we come up with some sort of system that gives us an ability to make those determinations? Um, we look at reason, authority, agreement between things, uh, conscience, our own conscience. All of them work together in some way of thinking about deontology and Christian ethics. Sorry, about deontology and Christian ethics. This thing cuts off the bottom of the slide. Um, we have to figure out how we apply all those things. And there are ways in which various scholars, particularly the next one we're going to talk about, Thomas Aquinas, has sought to try to address that. How do we take the, the teaching, the ethical teaching of the Old Testament, take a deontological, a duty approach, and then apply that to how we actually live our lives? Before I get into Aquinas, and then Luther, and then Calvin, and then Immanuel Kant, let's take a break. Okay, let's talk about... One of the most, if not the, if not the most, imp uh, important person related to especially Christian ethics in history, besides maybe Jesus and Moses, um, and that is Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican monk who lived in the middle part of the 13th century. I actually got depressed when I was studying this again because I'd forgotten it. Thomas Aquinas died when he was 49. Uh, That's quite old, though, wasn't it, for that time? Well, the, the point is that he's one of the most important theologians and philosophers in history. And he, he only, you know, the, the old saying, you know, when by the time Thomas Aquinas was my age, he'd been dead for ten years. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, now, Aquinas, as a monk, lived in a very important time. He was he was lived in Italy. Uh, this time in the 13th century was there had been an enormous <coughs> growth. Um, the there. Recovery from the Dark Ages was complete. It's called the Scholastic Era because they developed a very particular way of approaching um, philosophy and argument. In Scholasticism, for instance, and it's very awkward for people today to read this, because in Scholasticism, Aquinas and others would start out by making the other side of any argument they wanted to make. And they would give you all of the reasons why you should believe a certain thing and give you all of these references and then they would turn it around and say, but we don't agree with that, and here's why. And then they would give you all the references. So it's confusing for us to read it, but it actually is a very comprehensive kind of approach. In the 13th century, there were huge developments that had occurred and were occurring in philosophy, in medicine, in mathematics. Most particularly, the um, Muslim culture in the Iberian Peninsula, that is Spain and Portugal. They, the, after the golden age of Islam, which was a little just prior to this, there was an enormous amount of intellectual properties, particularly the Greek philosophers, that had been lost to Western Europe, but had been retained in the Muslim world. They were so, the Muslim world was so far in advance of the Christian West in terms of their scholarship, of their understanding, and at this point, by the middle of the 13th century, a lot of Aristotle and a lot of the Greek philosophers that had been completely forgotten and lost in Western Europe had been recovered as they, as they recovered some of the Muslim libraries that had existed in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, Cordoba, and elsewhere. And so there was this huge rush of philosophy and of intellectual pursuits based upon Aristotle and Socrates and a lot of other people that had been kind of rediscovered. Thomas Aquinas' most important work was the Summa Theologica. The Summa Theologica is a summary of really the whole story of God's relationship to humanity and history. It is a philosophical work, one of the most important documents in the history of Christian writing. Um, and in it, Aquinas systematically organizes human knowledge from a Christian perspective. And again, in the Scholastic Method, he starts out by stating all of the <laughs> objections uh, and even quoting references why those objections were made before he comes back around. The fundamental thing in, with regard to ethics that Aquinas does is in relationship to the principle of natural law, which is a, coin he, uh, a term he coins. For Aquinas, duty is known by a rule of practical reason that tells us how our human nature requires us to act. Now. What Aquinas did was he proposed four different kinds of laws that exist. The first one is the eternal law, which is the, the law or principle of all things that is in the mind of God, and that God used in creation, creation being a major theme for Aquinas, that God used the eternal law which was in his mind in how he created everything. And in creating everything, 
he placed in everything a reflection of the eternal law, which Aquinas called natural law. That everything has natural inclinations. Trees grow up, rocks fall down, human beings are rational. All of these things are seen as aspects of the natural law that exists in all things as a reflection of the eternal law, which came out of God's mind when he created. There's a third kind of law, and that is human law, which are the laws that are passed in human society to try to regulate, to prevent the doing of bad and encourage the doing of good. And Aquinas believed that human law, rightly, was a reflection of natural law. And then, all of, this, all of these things are, are built in, kind of rational, this sort of natural, inherently present in human beings and in, in all things. But then Aquinas said there's a fourth kind of law, which he called divine law, which is special revelation. That's how God has communicated uh, to emphasize things or give specific directions, the special revelation, which is part particularly the incarnation of Jesus and the written word. That's the divine law. So the eternal law, which is God's mind and all of the principles in his mind that he used to create the world in which he embedded everything with a natural law, animate objects and inanimate objects. In terms of humanity, we've interpreted that natural law in human law. And then, in order to make sure that we're not getting off the path, God has given us the divine law, which is his special revelation in Scripture and through the incarnation of Jesus. Okay, so four kinds of law. Got that? Now, the natural law is the most important part. That's the philosophical principle on which everything else is based. The, the idea in Aquinas is that God implanted in everything in nature an inclination to act in a certain way. Plants, animals, rocks, rivers, everything has a particular orientation that is a reflection of the natural law. It acts a certain way because God caused it to be that way. Now, in human beings, um, we are created as rational creatures. Now, Aquinas talked about the fact that there was a distinction between what he called the theoretical reason and practical reason. Theoretical reason is the, um, the tendency of all things in nature, including humans, to act in a certain way. Practical reason, and that's sort of teleological, God set goals. Trees are supposed to be like this, and so he made them so that trees will be like that. Animals, you know, lions are supposed to be like this, and so the goal is they were created with a certain nature to be lion-like. But in addition to that, human beings are given what Aquinas called practical reason which allows us to make judgments about what is right and what is wrong, what should be done and what should be avoided. And it gives us the ability to formulate rules and principles. In fact, it's this practical reason that allows us to make human laws, which Aquinas insisted were based upon, although they could be messed up. Because human beings as rational creatures, we can decide we're not going to be obedient. Obviously, that's what the fall is. But generally speaking, human laws should be a, a, an application of our practical reason to the natural law that exists. Make sense? We create laws that are supposed to keep us in the right direction according to the way that God intended people to be, the natural law that is in us. So, of those four kinds of laws, Aquinas insisted that in understanding the law, there were, there were three major principles. One, the law is a rule of reason directed toward the common good. God's laws are always for the good, and God allows us to perceive those laws based upon our reason. He made us rational for a reason, so to speak. Um, law is given by proper authority, first by God, and then as they are human laws, they are, they are given through human authorities. And third, law must be published and made known. People can't be expected to obey at least the human laws, lest they know what they are. Natural laws, he believed all people had an inherent sense of. And the beginning of all law is the eternal law, which is in God's mind, that is reflected in natural law in all things, but we humans have the practical reason, the ability to decide whether or not we're going to follow the natural law, either in how we make human laws or whether we're going to violate that you know, and be disobedient to human laws. Does that make sense? The point in all of this, the most important part, is this is all inherent. This is, all, this is how God made everything, most specifically how he made human beings, and that those four kinds of laws the eternal law, the natural law, which is in all things, the human law, which we make based upon natural law, and then God's specific directions or special revelation in the divine law, all of those things tell us how we should act. 
And if we are sensitive to the natural law that exists in us, then we will be able to make the right judgments. Now, all of those laws, particularly in our case, the natural law, the human law, and then the divine law, which is scripture, the special revelation, all of those are duty-oriented. The, the natural law is God telling everything you have a responsibility, if you will, to be a certain way. And we have to interpret that. We have a duty to create human laws that are consistent with God's natural law. Okay? That's... And what, one of the things that Aquinas did, because he then said that we can make, we can use our human reason, our practical reason, to decide not to follow laws, he has, a, a, within his system, there is an understanding of how sin comes into it, and how redemption comes into it, that our natural judgment is broken, many times, and then because of uh, Christ's incarnation and his sacrifice on our behalf, he makes us whole again, which gives <coughs> us, returns to us the ability to make the right judgments. And so his system takes into account sin, incarnation, redemption, the, the relationship of the created order in nature, um, the specific commandments that come to Christians through the divine law or the special revelation of scripture. All of this stuff fits in together. You'll remember last week I talked about there are four general approaches to uh, modern Christian ethics. There's synergy, integrity, realism, and liberation. Synergy seeks ways for humans to work with other understandings of human good. In other words, how does the Christian church work with government in order to have the most good for the most people? That's called synergy. There is integrity, which is very much the sort of pacifist movement, the, the brethren and the Moravians and others, which would say that no, we can't work with the government. The government, you have to pick your side. You're either on the secular side or you're on the Christian side. And integrity is the, is the ethical belief that we have to maintain a strict Christian witness, a Christian orientation, and we can't mix those things up. Realism warns us against thinking that we're smart enough or holy enough to do the right thing. And liberation emphasizes the freedom from oppression that is central to the Christian message. So, synergy, integrity, realism, and liberation. Synergy... The modern idea of synergy, of having the Christian, the God, uh, built-in kind of motivations, working with the worldly powers, is very much based upon Aquinas. Because Aquinas said natural law, which God gave us, and all things, needs to be interpreted correctly in human law. And of course, human law is given through the authorities that exist. So he was very much the idea of we work together with the other powers in the world. Um, Aquinas would say that because natural law is part of human nature, it includes duties that everybody understands it and recognizes. We all have a sense of duty to recognize and worship God. Now, you may say the new atheists don't, but there is a whole branch of apologetics related to this. Um, it's called evangelical epistemology, which says that the ability to perceive of God and recognize Him in things is a natural, is an inherent ability, like sight and hearing. And if somebody doesn't have that, then they have a disability. So there's a whole kind of area of apologetics that says that human beings, that's why every culture that has ever existed that we know anything about has had some sense of the divine, some religious belief, that there is an, a rightly inherent awareness of God. Well, Aquinas said that, and that that is part of the natural law reflected in us, that we see, we recognize God. It also, the natural law, also gives us a sense of duty or responsibility to maintain human society, to create governments, to obey laws, to refrain from harming other people, etc. That do no wrong kind of idea. That those are reflections of the natural law, of God's mind put in us that we should then reflect in the way human laws are made. That all of this is inherent. It's all built in. So human laws should be shaped by this natural law that exists in all things. <clears throat> natural law then provides a strong basis for individual moral accountability that apart from us being wounded in our rationality and in our morality by sin we all should have a very clear idea of what is moral what is right what our duty is what natural law God gave us that we should follow we all know that you know killing and eating babies who happen to live in our neighborhood is the wrong thing to do well where do we get that good source of protein. Um, 
We get that because there is built into us a sense, based on the natural law reflected in us, that some things are right and some things are wrong. This is a duty to be obedient to that. Now, Aquinas develops this in great, to great length in terms of the principles that are underlying this. He talks about that we have a duty of self-preservation, we have um, other duties that provide for guidance for the inclination we have, be they sexual inclinations, duties to care for offspring, <clears throat> commitment and duty to the rest of our family members, duty to our tribe or society we belong to. All of this gets covered in Aquinas' ethics. Um, and, yes? Natural law permits the mother bird to throw out the deformed baby from the nest. I'm sorry, what? You didn't hear that. Natural law permits the mother bird to throw out the deformed baby from the nest. Well, um, in that case, natural law would say that a mother bird has a responsibility to care for her children. If a, child, if a baby bird is not going to survive, or the survival of that baby bird is going to be harmful to the other fledgling birds, then the mother bird, by natural law, would get rid of that, of that bird. And Aquinas would say that's part of the natural law. That's how God made that bird. I mean, how does... She, this fascinating thing, and of course I'm, I'm into this, the animal thing right now because we've got puppies and we're doing all this, getting puppies and we're doing all this studying, that um, and any kind of animal, the mother, when the babies are born, nobody teaches that mother how to care for those babies. Where does that come from? Aquinas would say that's part of the natural law, and that would apply to how a mother bird cares for the, the baby birds as well. You know, for, for a dog, a mother dog, the first puppy she ever has, she knows how to lick them in order to get them, because when they're too young to be able to get up and, you know, move around, to get them to eliminate, how to clean it up, how to teach the, you know, teach the puppies what to do, um, how to correct them in a way that they'll grow so that they, you know, are socialized. In the, all of this stuff, where does that come from? That's the natural law, which was put in them by God, Aquinas would say. Yes? But, so my question is, how does this apply to humans? Well, he would say that human <clears throat> beings have the same thing. That we have, uh, we have basic understandings that God put in us about, particularly in, in an ethical case, what is right and what is wrong. That we all, that yes, we may be bent slightly, I'm using the word from C.S. Lewis, you know, that, that, um, that we are... You know, if, we, if we're not broken, we're broken. We're at least bent. That sin has caused us to have um, sometimes bad judgment about things, and that we we have practical reason. Human beings alone, of all of God's creation, we're given the rational ability to make judgments about whether we're going to be obedient or not. You know, um, and so we sometimes get it wrong. You know, we will put laws in place that will oppress certain people, but eventually. Society writes itself. Whenever laws have been passed that said it is okay, you know, we always use the Nazis because they're such a relatively recent and vivid example. Passed laws that said that, you know, properties could be taken away from Jewish people and given to, to non-Jewish German citizens. And that was the law. But we all look at that now and go, that was completely wrong. Okay, that, that was unjust. That was, that was not the way it should be and we're not going to allow that again. Well, why do we say that? Because there is something in a healthy person that recognizes good and, good and bad, right and wrong, evil and good. And so, even though there may have been people in power who were evil at various times, who did evil things, the vast majority of people look at those kinds of things and go, no, that's wrong. God has made in us, and I think even the people who did those things knew they were wrong. But they were more concerned about satisfying their own appetites. And the more you go in an intentional wrong direction, the less sensitized you are, I think. But So Aquinas would say all of this stuff is in us. And in fact, he went so far. Now, one of the things you need to realize that, that Aquinas was looking at, he was a monk, and he was writing primarily for uh, church people. One of the reasons for that is only church people could read back then. <laughs> And so most of what he was writing in terms of philosophy and theology would have been directed toward priests and monks and other people in the church. <clears throat> and much of it was in order to try to encourage a sense of the natural order of things, which, which means obedience. 
obedience to those in authority over you. And that was a big theme for him, is obedience and those in authority, both those in secular authority, but especially those in the, the authority of the church. The, there have always been issues, and in the, the Middle Ages, scholastic period included, there were particularly conflicts between who's really in charge here, is it the Pope or the King? All right, and to what extent? Well, um, while Aquinas was writing to convince people that there was, there was a natural order, natural law that gave us a natural order, and that the laws were there for a reason, he still said that it's possible for humans to pass wrong laws, and the highest authority is for us, if we are sensitive to, and, and listening well to the natural law sensitivity God has put in us, that we should obey our conscience. In fact, he went so far as to say, that if there is a conflict between human authorities and our conscience, we must obey our conscience. That was unheard of. But it is a natural reflection of his idea that every human being, because of the natural law, has an inherent moral accountability, and that even though we have a responsibility, and he emphasized that a lot, to be obedient to human authorities, ultimately we had to say, what does my conscience tell me is really God's law here? What is the right thing to do? And you, if you, you know, go forward 750 years from there, you can see that this whole move in the late 20th century toward believing that there are crimes against humanity, that there are duties that are bigger than what the authorities are telling you, is exactly what he was saying. That to do an atrocity because the people in authority told you you should is not justified. Your conscience should rule that out. And even if you have to take serious consequences on yourself, you should do what your conscience tells you is right. Okay? In that regard, he was way ahead of his time. He was way ahead of his time in a lot of ways, to be honest about it. Um, now, there was, there was a serious question that was raised later in Aquinas, and Aquinas attempts to address this. It wasn't actually later. Some people, when he was still writing, said this. That, um, but what about... If some people felt that Aquinas was allowing human reason, that is our practical reason, our ability to make judgments, our ability to be sensitive to the natural law God has placed in us, that that was trumping God's rules, that God himself was subject to our perceptions of what should be. And Aquinas said, no, all of our sensitivities in that regard, all of the natural law in us, our conscience exists because it was made by God. And so ultimately, all of this is from God. But if all of this is from God, the objections that, that started when Aquinas was still uh, writing, still alive, that he addressed somewhat, is what about the people who are not open to God? What about the people who are still in their sin, who have not been redeemed, who are still under control of the, you know, the Lord of this world, if you will, of the devil? Then their perceptions of God's intention in the natural law are not going to be pure. And how do you deal with that? Um, so Aquinas got challenged on that, and this became a big issue later on. A lot of people dealt with it, and especially in the Reformation. I'm going to talk about that next. Before I get into that, let me say that Aquinas, as I say, his system is very complete. He presented the natural law as kind of a, a set of principles. And from those principles, he then created a system whereby you could take those general principles. Remember, we started by saying we need a system by which we can bring the principles down to a day-to-day -day thing and help us make decisions. Aquinas did that. He created what has since become known as casuistry. Casuistry is the process of taking general ethical principles, and this is, this is the ethical standards that the Catholic Church especially uses, although Protestants do it too, and figure out how to apply that down to the point where you have to make a decision day-to-day. -day. All right? Um, Casuistry, C-A-S-U-I-S-T-R-Y, casuistry, or casuistry. Um, and it's the system for making eth down ethical decisions. For instance, if um, you know, we're supposed to tell the truth, that's a basic principle, tell the truth. Well, if a woman is being abused by her husband and she knows if, he tells him the, if she tells him the truth about something, that he is going to beat her up. Is she obligated to tell the truth? Because you, a street, sort of siphons this down to practical kind of decision making. 
And the answer would be no, that there is something that trumps that, and that is in order to prevent violence against yourself or somebody else, you don't have to obey that rule. Another rule would be to respect personal property. <clears throat> Suppose somebody um, asks you to hold a knife or a machete for them. Would you hang on to this for me? Well, the principle is that they have, it's their property, they have a right to it whenever they want it back. But if they show up at your house and you know for a fact that they're going to take that machete and kill somebody with it, are you obligated to give it back to them? Or should you hold it? The, the prince, you know, so casuistry would help us figure that out and would say, well, no, there's a higher responsibility, and that is the responsibility to preserve human life that is even more important than the responsibility to, re to respect personal property. And so, and this system became the system that's used, especially in the Catholic Church. Catholic ethical decision making is based upon that. Now, um, casuistry, if you look it up in, in the dictionary, it'll have at least one definition that's very negative. It will say, you know, to make um, questionable and dithering kinds of evaluations of ethical issues. In other words, it's negative. And casuistry has been abused. It has been used to justify all kinds of bad things. But for the most part, both with Catholics and with Protestants, it has been a system whereby we can take these broad principles, which Aquinas said were from a natural law, and begin to apply them to day-to-day -day active ethical questions. All right? Um, the, the big thing that came up, well, let me go to this slide. So, Aquinas' natural law and the casuistry principles that came out of that were foundational to much of Christian ethics, especially Catholic, but Protestant as well. The Protestants used them uh, as well, even the Reformers somewhat, although they began to question the, whether Aquinas was right in the application of it. After the Protestant Reformation, before the Protestant Reformation, there was, at least in Europe, there was a central authority. Um, the church sort of crossed all borders, trumped everything. But after the, the Protestant Reformation, natural law sort of waned for a while, but then it came back as a starting point for modern international law. When countries started writing laws on how they're going to relate to other countries, and those two countries might represent different cultures, different languages, etc., how do they make decisions on how they're supposed to relate to each other? And they began to say, well, there are certain things that just, you know, we have an inherent sense are right or wrong in how we relate to other countries and other people. That's natural law, this inherent sense. And so for both Catholic and Protestant scholars, after the Reformation and a while later, began to use natural law to establish rules for trade, for commerce, and to limit the damages of war. Just this is, and they, and they sometimes would look back to Aquinas specifically, or they would just use the same kind of principles. Now, appeals to natural law became less frequent as modern nations developed more extensive systems of laws. In other words, they developed all their own human laws, and they didn't really feel a need to appeal to natural law anymore. We've, you know, we've covered all the bases. And then World War II comes along, and we have a level of atrocity that had never been experienced before in the same kind of way. We, you know, the reason that, that we had a First World War, which was politically motivated, the Second World War was really in much more ethically, ethically motivated, a need to stop the Nazis from doing what they were doing, both in conquering other countries and oppressing other peoples, etc. The First World War had to do with conflicts between nations and who was allied with who. The Second World War really was based much more on ethical questions. And so in the Second World War, um, and after the Second World War, issues like how do we make big decisions about atrocities? And as I said earlier, this led to a whole uh, new line of use of natural law about there are certain things everybody knows you should and should not do. You should not commit genocide against a people. Well, through much of history, prior to the mid-20th century, the idea was, well, if you're the, you're the strong guy, if your army is stronger, then you're in charge. And there was not, at least not articulated, um, as often, this idea that there are certain things that natural law tells us that nations should not do just because they can. And so this began to be much more uh, used. Natural law was used in the formation of the United States, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What is self-evident other than inherent natural law? That God, you know, that God has made us all and given us freedom and we have a right of self-determination. That's natural law.
Natural law was called upon in the, the civil rights movement, the idea that there's a natural law against the injustices of uh, oppression because of, of race. It was used in, against slavery, for instance. Um, natural law has been very, very important in so many of the earlier as well, but even more so the post-World War II kinds of things and the whole crimes against humanity idea. Um, the whole argument against weapons of mass destruction is brand new. The idea previously is if you had a weapon that could effectively destroy all of your enemies, then boy, you're winning. You're, you know, you got, you got the world. And it's only very recently we've said that there are certain kinds of weapons, you know, and this is in the nuclear range, there's certain kinds of weapons that whether you're losing or not, you, it is not justified to use. Weapons of mass destruction are not acceptable, and nobody will admit they think they're acceptable, although everybody recognizes that, that a weaker country that has a weapon of mass destruction, if they're losing, then they're liable to use it. That's what everybody's afraid of, but nobody agrees that it's a good idea, even though somebody may reach the point that they decide to do it. You see, that, and that's all very new, but it all goes back to this idea of natural law. Now, Christians and Jewish thinkers have especially made use of the idea that some moral rules are universal and they're part of nature because that links us back to God, contrary to the new atheists. If we believe that there are inherent in human beings certain kinds of moral values that are part of our nature, and they're part of our nature because God created us as having part of their nature, that's an affirmation of God being the creator God. And so this has been very important to both Jewish and Christian um, scholars and thinkers. But that raises the question again, which was raised even in Aquinas' day, of whether or not fallen people, those who are sinful and broken and have not been redeemed, have not accepted Christ, as a Christian would say, whether bro uh, fallen people still have enough of the human nature that God gave them to know what is required. Is our nature fallen as well? Or is our... our Rational ability to perceive uh, the natural law broken as well. And there has been difference on that. Again, that question was raised even on Aquinas' day, and he said, no, that there, we still have enough that while it may be darkened, we still have the ability to make the right judgments. Our practical reason can still see through to the right thing. Others have disagreed with that, and most particularly because of, of the, the focus on um, sin as being comprehensive. The Protestant reformers said that human nature is so damaged by sin that reason lacked the secure, did not have the ability to find a secure knowledge of anything that nature or God requires. In other words, our rationality, our practical reason, our ability to perceive what really is right and wrong is also fallen. In the reformers, all of the reformers, Protestant reformers, sort of got to this point, but uh, it's, it's clearly reflected in the hyper-Calvinist, the five-point Calvinism, TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, the first of those, the T, is total depravity. Total depravity means all of us is fallen, and that we do not have the ability, therefore, to seek God or to be inclined toward Him on our own. Aquinas would have said, we still have our reason. Our reason was made by God, and God will allow us, by the natural reason we have, the practical reason we have, to seek the right thing. The reformers said no. Yes, John. Aren't those two different things? What's that? Aren't those two different things? Mm. I mean, what, what, what Calvin was talking about was depravity in the ability to pursue God. That's my intention. Not well, the depravity of understanding natural law. He said everything. That's why it's total depravity. Because the argument the Catholics were making is that there was still a part of us, particularly our reason, and this is based upon Aquinas, which will give us the ability to seek God. Aquinas said, I understand so that I might believe. That our understanding was inherent, and if we understood, then we might seek God and believe based upon our rational abilities. And those same rational abilities are what gave us the, gave us the ability to see the moral right, the natural law. Now, and there's two very different streams here. Aquinas said, um, and this is based upon Aristotle, I understand that I might believe. Uh, uh, Aristotle didn't say, I understand that I might believe, but he said that human reason is inherent and inviolable. Aquinas picked up on that from Aristotle and said, I understand so that I might believe. Rationality exists still and I can use it. Interestingly, Augustine said, I believe that I might understand. He said the opposite. 
actually Aquinas was before, uh, the, the Augustine was before Aquinas by 800 years. But the reformers rejected Aristotle, for the, at least that part of Aristotle, they rejected Aquinas and they went back to Augustine and said, my reason is broken as well. I believe, I accept God and am healed that I might understand. Apart from that, I don't have understanding. And so that's how they differed from Aquinas. So, so when Calvin said, told the friend of it, he was talking about... He means all of it. He means our ability spiritually to, to seek after God or to understand but God. Much more. But much more. It, it, part of that, the total part of that, is specifically in response to, there is nothing in me, in a human being, that is able to seek out God. I am totally <laughs> depraved. Not just spiritually depraved. I am rationally depraved too. All of that is broken. Okay. So, we cannot figure out, according to the Reformers, what God desires for us. We can't see how the natural law should lead us to the right moral decisions, apart from the redemption and salvation that comes in Jesus Christ. Now, Martin Luther said this. All you Lutherans, listen up. Um, Luther said, here, we, when he's talking about ethics, here we must divide Adam's children, all mankind, into two parts. The first belonging to the kingdom of God, the second to the kingdom of the world. All those who truly believe in Christ belong to God's kingdom, for Christ is king and lord in God's kingdom. He, now this is part of a treatise he did on secular authority, and he went on. If all the world were true Christians, that is, if everyone truly believed, there would be neither need for nor use of princes, kings, lords, the sword, or the law. What would there be for them to do? Seeing that true Christians have the Holy Spirit in their hearts, which teaches and moves them to love everybody, wrong no one, and suffer wrongs gladly, even unto <coughs> death, where all wrongs are endured willingly, and what is done is done freely, there is no place for quarreling, disputes, courts, punishments, laws, or the sword. And therefore, laws and the secular sword cannot possibly find any work to do among Christians, especially since they of themselves do much more than any laws or teachings might demand. Luther believed... The secular law is for non-Christians. But we as Christians have a responsibility to support that. He was synergistic in that regard. That we have a responsibility to support the local authorities unless they violate the, the conscience that God has given us, unless they violate our Christian obligations, then we need to recognize that. Luther said, you can't just give up on all that because you know God gives us human laws too. God assigns human authorities. We need to support them. We need to even participate with them when it's necessary. That, and, and Luther specifically said that human laws made by the authorities that God has put in place serve to limit the damage that unbelievers can do. Christians don't need them because we should be better than the law would require. But human law, based upon God's intention, should limit the evil that's done by those who are not guided by love. It should restrain evil, but Luther never got to the point of saying that it should accomplish good, that there's an upside for it. Um, and Luther went on to say, for this is the work, meaning to be involved in government, to be involved in, in uh, maintaining the law or being involved in the military or anything else. This is the work of which you yourself have no need, but your neighbor and the whole world most certainly does. So Christians shouldn't need this, but the world does. And therefore, if you see that there is a lack of hangmen, of court officials, judges, lords, or princes, and you find that you have the necessary skills, you should offer your services and seek office so that, so that authority, which is so greatly needed, will never come to be held in contempt, become powerless, or perish. The world cannot get by without it. In order to protect non-believers more than anything else, we Christians should be ready to participate in worldly government and maintaining the law. All right? Now... Um, interestingly, people suggested even in Luther's time that, well, if, we, if it really is, you, Christians and non-Christians are completely different, we're separated, then shouldn't we just get out of here, just leave them all to their devices? Or shouldn't we, and, and Luther very interestingly said, um, to try to rule a whole country or the world by means of, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, there's one more point. Some people said, well, why can't we just make sure everybody follows the gospel? Let's just get control and then we'll try to run everything. And Luther said, that's not going to work. He said, to try to run a whole country or the world by means of the gospel is like herding together wolves, lions, eagles, and sheep in the same pen. The sheep would certainly keep the peace and let themselves be governed and pastured peaceably, 
but they would not live long. <laughs> Okay, he recognized the danger in the world and that we, we, we couldn't do it all by ourselves, but we could participate in the authorities. So, some critics of the reformers said, why not abandon the sword? As I just said, many, we don't need it. That's not for us. We are part of a different world. They would say, let others take on the task of maintaining order, passing laws, enforcing laws, being in the military, since there never is any shortage of people who seem to want power. We will devote ourselves to living as true Christians. So they took the first part of Luther's admonition that we have to divide the world in two. But then instead of saying that Christians don't need the law, but they need to participate in the structures of human law and order, in order to protect everybody else, particularly the pacifist Christians, and here I'm thinking specifically of Michael Sattler, in, uh, Michael Sattler in 1527, led a group of Swiss brethren, later they became named, known as the, the Moravian Brethren, was one, one group, they're different brethren churches. They got together and they issued what was called the Schleitheim Confession of Faith. The Schleitheim Confession of Faith says, and I'm going to quote from it, there is nothing else in the world in all creation than good or evil, believing and unbelieving, darkness and light, the world and those who come out of the world, God's temple and idols, Christ and Belial, and none will have part with the other. In other words, they took Luther's comments and they said there's an absolute divide. You're either of light or you're of darkness. And they said that if you are of light, then you should not have anything to do with darkness. And that means don't have anything to do with the military or political powers. You don't vote. You don't pay taxes, you don't serve in the military, you don't do any of that. The Schleitheim Confession says, includes these words, for instance. It does not befit a Christian to be a magistrate. The rule of government is according to the flesh, that of the Christians according to the spirit. Their houses and dwelling remain in this world, and that of the Christians is in heaven. Their citizenry is in this world, that of the Christians is in heaven. The weapons of their battle and warfare are carnal and only against the flesh, but the weapons of Christians are spiritual against the fortifications of the devil. The, world are, the worldly are armed with steel and iron, but Christians are armed with the armor of God, with truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. So the Mennonite churches which came out of this, the Brethren churches, sometimes called the Peace Churches as a group, they reject military service, they withdraw as far as possible from any participation in government or politics, they emphasize community and simplicity. You know, the Amish are part of this movement, the Mennonite movement of the Amish. Um, they focused on self-sufficient farming communities. They refused to pay taxes. They refused to serve in the military. Those two things, not paying taxes and not serving the military, means they were often persecuted by the governments where they were. A lot of them ended up migrating to the United States or to parts of Russia, where there were large plots of land they could live <coughs> independently and not be under the control of those who disagreed with them. Now, Luther represented the synergy approach to, uh, to ethics, meaning we as Christians have values, we need to figure out how we can work with the government on that, because we need both. The peace churches, the, or they were all Anabaptists, they believed in adult baptism and confession. The Moravian brethren, the Swiss brethren, the Mennonites, etc. They are of the integrity Mode, which means that there is a difference between Christians and the rest of the world, and we need to emphasize that difference. We need to stand out as a light in contrast, not in conjunction with the rest of the things in the world. Um, and so there was a, you know, there's a very different kind of understanding, even though they're basing it on some of the same things that Luther said. Yes, John. Um, I think when we think of pacifism, we all get this, this thing, this, this is, we have this idea, image. Um, but today, you know, with the increase, in, I like handguns, but with the increase in handguns and, and, and the, all this stuff that's happening, it seems like the church's rhetoric is becoming more bellicose in that, in that she, she's rising up and guns and gone. I get that. I get that. Not all churches. <laughs> but, but I get that. I understand. But then comes this guy, Stanley Hallowas, that, that, that speaks of pacifism. Do you see pacifism as being a dead dog that will have no influence, or do you see it as something that we as a church in North America will have to face? 
passivism and which is a reflection of integrity. Howard Wass is one of the primary advocates, sort of the founder of the integrity movement of Christian ethics based upon his Mennonite background. So this is all tied together with what we're talking about. Um, the, it will always exist, and rightly so, because we need that as a, as a counterpoint. We need that influence. Okay? Whether we completely agree with it or not, it's a valid influence, just like liberation theology. We may not agree with all of it, but this constant reminder that Jesus spoke out against oppression of those who were weak, we need to be reminded of that. Now, neither of those will ever be the dominant Christian motif or you know, the Christian paradigm, but they will continue to exist. They both have a legitimate place, and we need to be influenced by them. Um, so, and, and how, you know, uh, Haramas, Haramas is the integrity side, that we need to be separate, we need to be different, we need to not go by the standards. Just like that's the integrity, the liberation, the idea of uh, primary focus for Christianity should be to relieve the oppressed. Um, synergy, which Luther and others would say is we need to figure out ways to work together. That particularly has been a Catholic theme. Um, all of those are very important. And then realism, which was um, Niebuhr, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the idea that we, don't, we shouldn't get carried away that we're so good. You know, we are broken, we're lost, we're weak. We need to be modest about our own abilities. Let's be realistic about this. Those are the primary ways of thinking about that stuff. And I think, I don't think passivism or the whole integrity focus is going to go away. It will always be there, and we need it to be. We need to have that influence. Personally, personally I've just been, I've collided with it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's so contra my, my, my view, you know, but it, it's undeniable. What yeah. do you do with that? I mean, Jesus wouldn't take a gun. What do you, what do, you do with it? Exactly. There's a famous thing, um, Festo Govindri was a bishop in East Africa during the time, in Uganda, during the time of Idi Amin. In fact, he was in exile. He was out of the country for a while. Festo Govindri was his name. He's a bishop in the uh, Anglican Church there. And a reporter asked him one time, they said, um, if you were in the room with Idi Amin, this is when Idi Amin was executing a lot of Christians, you know, doing horrible things. And they asked Bishop Govindri, they said, if you were standing in front of of Idi Amin, and you had a gun, what would you do? And Bishop Kavendri said, I would hand it to President Amin and say, this must be your weapon, because my weapon is love. Hmm. That's good. That's good. There you see the pacifism side of it. Now, he was, a, he was a man who was exiled from his own country, who's, who's, he had a bishop whose congregations were being decimated by, you know, by Amin. That was his response, okay? A couple more things I want to talk about. Uh, I won't get into that. I've mentioned those a little bit. John Calvin comes along. John Calvin was the next generation reformer after Martin Luther. They were not at the same time. Um, Calvin was only nine years old when Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg um, castle door, or cathedral door. But Calvin comes along, and he agreed with, sided with Luther in believing that sin had changed human nature. This is the total depravity. And that it limited the power of human reason so that the natural law that Aquinas taught was not possible. We could not come to belief because of understanding. Right? Our rationality could not perceive the natural law that God intended in things and by understanding that come to a point of believing because of it. Now, Calvin saw three uses for the law. The first two, Luther had said. Luther had, had said that the law convinces fallen human beings of their sinfulness. Now here we're talking about the application of the law, of God's law in human law. It convinces people of their sinfulness, what they're doing wrong. Secondly, it restrains the evil they would do if they were left to make just their own choices. It doesn't let people just rape and pillage and murder because they can. But Calvin made a very important additional point about the law. And it's the third use of the law, which he goes beyond Luther here, and said that the law guides Christians to know not only what they shouldn't do, but what they ought to do. And it encourages them to do it, to do it over the last three words there. In other words, the law can not only be something that curbs the bad, it can be used to encourage the good. Luther, while he talked a lot about the relationship between the church and the political authorities, you know, the secular authorities, and that we need to be willing to do that for the sake of the world, even though Christians shouldn't need it. He never actually got involved in politics himself. Luther did not, you know, he didn't run anything. Calvin, because Calvin believed that not only did the, the human law, as applied by Christians, 
prevent the evil, but it could be used to advocate the good. Calvin got involved in the politics in Geneva. He was, um, now there were magistrates who were secular authorities. He was in charge of the church, but he was the primary leader. It's, uh, some people would define Geneva in his time as a theocracy. Was he like a mayor? Well, sort of a mayor. I mean, he was the primary sort of first citizen kind of thing. And clearly in charge of the church. But there were, there was at least one time that the magistrates were so upset with him, they, they ran him out of town. And then later he was they were told to come back because things were going bad. So he didn't have absolute authority in that response. In that regard, it wasn't like he was king of a theocracy. But he did get involved in that because he believed that the law could, could guide Christians as to what they ought to do and encourage them to do it. And that was a very different understanding about human law. And so here you get Aquinas, you get Luther, you get the confession, uh, the Schleinheim Confession Churches, and you get Calvin, all of them working from a Christian perspective, have a very different understanding of how involved we should be in ethical issues with regard to how it gets done in, in secular kind of courts and laws and things of that sort. Um, Calvin actually developed a, a very complete theology of this with regard to how we're to, uh, how we're to use uh, law, whether it be actual human law or just an understanding of the natural law in order to encourage the right things. In, within Calvinist theology, there were developed a, the sense in which there were orders of creation that God had put natural laws within. One of them was the family, that there was a certain order of things that we as Christians should perceive as being natural in a family, of work, of government, and of religion. This idea that in all of those practices, in all those the, uh, arenas of our living and our lives, that there were certain kinds of things that were told should not occur in that, and some that we're, the law could allow us, the natural law and the human law, could encourage us to do. I don't have a lot of time to talk about that. I want to get one more, one more thing. So how do we apply these deontological ethics? There are different ways. You have the casuistry that came out of Aquinas's, sort of taking the big principles of natural law and applying them to specific cases and the system for doing that. You have um, various ways in which it was perceived that you involve yourself as the church in coordinating or cooperating with the secular authorities and human laws in order to maintain order. All of these have been based upon the principle of autonomy, that right, truly right actions are self-chosen or self-motivated. That truly ethical principles are not principles that are required or mandated or forced by some authority. If it's truly an ethical moral decision, you have to pick it. And so the principle of autonomy has always been a major one in ethical issues, especially deontological ethics. You have to decide for yourself, what is my duty? What is my responsibility? There may be different systems, different ways you can approach it, but you have to, you have to accept that for yourself, okay? Um, and the problem is always understood, it's not knowing the right thing to do. In 99% in of the cases, we know the right thing to do. But rather, facing the moral choice between several things or several duties that might be right. And here's where we get into the differences between a true duty or responsibility and a prima facie duty. One of the systems of thinking, practical um, logic in deontology, is to say, whenever you're faced with a duty, you need to say, is this really the duty or is there something underneath it? Okay, my duty is not to feed the cat outside my house. But I feel I do have a duty to be kind to animals. And if this cat is hungry and coming to us for help, I feel a responsibility to feed it. But the feeding the cat is the, just the prima facie. The duty is that I have a responsibility to be humane, right? See the difference? And so one of the principles is making sure that you really understand what the real duty is because that will keep you from going in the wrong direction by misinterpreting a prima facie duty as being the real point, right? You know, my duty, if I'm, if I'm in the military, my duty is to obey authority. But if the authority tells me to kill these civilians, I need to say, now wait a minute. In this case, is my primary duty to obey authority or is that just the prima facie duty? Do I have a more fundamental duty and that is to not commit atrocities against human beings, to respect human life? You know, and, and where does that apply? So that's one of, the, one of the ways in which we begin to apply it. Um, 
It's also true that in deontological ethics, consistency and independence, independence being the self of the autonomy, uh, consistency and independence of moral action vouches for the rightness of our actions. If I, if I make a moral decision based upon principles that I believe, duties that I have, that my responsibility, and throughout my life I am always consistent with that, my ability to be consistent in that in itself vouches for the, for the truth of that duty. It has integrity for me to always be consistent. That I will not accept, you know, I do not give more data. I don't care whether they threaten to take my car when I know I haven't done anything wrong or whatever. I go, well, I wish you wouldn't, but okay. And they go, well, you know, you can pay me right now. We won't have to do this. I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I will not pay more data. And I will not change that based upon circumstances. Even if they arrest me, even if they impound my car, I will not pay a bribe. And as long as I'm consistent with that, my consistency itself, I believe, vouchsafes for the truth of that as a principle. Okay? And so all the way down the line, I'm over time, but I have to say Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, great, one of the greatest philosophers ever, even though I disagree with a lot of what he said, um, brilliant thinker, German, um, he talked about the categorical imperatives. He said that there's certain moral rules which everyone knows are true and everyone must follow because not following them would be irrational. Example, tell the truth. Think about the, the logical consequences if people did not believe they should tell the truth. How could I ever trust anybody? How could anybody ever trust me? How could I get anything done? I could never buy anything in a store because for all I know there's poison in that candy or whatever else it is. That telling the truth to not tell the truth. Now, uh, people do lie, but we know that's wrong. The right thing, the duty, the responsibility is to tell the truth. And it would be irrational of us not to know that telling the truth is the right thing to do. Because if people consistently, as a pattern, refuse to tell the truth, what would happen to human society? So not believing that telling the truth is the right thing is irrational. Anything, any moral principle, now he believed it had to be something you accept for yourself, it had to be autonomous, and so it followed the principle of autonomy. Anything that was a self-determined truth that it would be irrational not to obey, he called a categorical imperative. Not because of the results, he talked about a theoretical imperative, I'm sorry, a hypothetical imperative would be if you do it because of, the, of results. Okay, you make a decision on whether or not I'm going to cheat on this test based upon the fact I need to get a better score. That's not a categorical imperative, don't cheat on this test. That's a theoretical imperative because you're doing it for the results. Okay, that's a teleological thing. A categorical imperative is one in which there are no conditions, there's no qualifiers, you have to do it. Now, Kant was a little crazy about this. Kant said if somebody came to your door and they said, I'm looking for, for Mike because I'm going to kill him, do you know where he is? Kant would say, if he was hiding in your closet, you'd say, yeah, he's in the closet, second door on the right. Because Kant would say, you have to tell the truth. It's a categorical imperative. You can't violate that. And Kant would say, besides, if you said, no, he's not here, and Mike had escaped out the window and was now running down the street, and the guy turns and walks away and runs into him in the street and kills him there, then you, were, you had a part in having him be killed. Now, that's a little crazy. Kant was a little crazy. Like I say, I don't agree with him on everything. But he believed categorical imperatives were so much of an imperative, you could not violate them ever, okay? But always the greatest challenge in deontological ethics is moving from principles to specific moral cases. The whole process of deontological evidence, uh, ethics has not been so much to decide what are, the, what are the responsibilities, what are the duties. We have a pretty natural sense on what those are. It's how do I take the principles and apply them on a day-to-day -day action. How do I decide whether or not I get involved in a business deal if it looks a little shady to me? What's the process that I need to go through? How do I make down, you know, street-level decisions based upon the duties or responsibilities I feel? And there have been a number of ways of, of doing that. One of them, for instance, uh, a very modern way, is to believe in deontology, to believe that there are duties, there are responsibilities, and this is where Kant, Kant goes wrong. But there's a principle called proportionalism. Proportionalism is the, the strategy of doing this, of taking the principles of deontological ethics and moving them down to specific cases. Proportionalism says, okay, I have certain duties and responsibilities. 
But if I find myself with a conflict of duties, I need to consider, well, what are the end results if I decide A versus B, if both of them feel like duties to me? So what that is, proportionalism, is sort of a combination of deontology, I have a duty, I have a responsibility, and teleology, what's going to be the end result? You start with the duty, but then you have to decide when you have a conflict, what's going to be the end result? And you bring into it a teleological or a goal-oriented kind of thing. So there have been a lot of different processes, from the casuistry that came out of uh, Aquinas, to the various ways in which the reformers talked about getting involved or not getting involved with secular authority in order to maintain the right, the good, uh, and then through that process come up with specific rules and laws about what you do, to Kant's and categorical imperatives to proportionalism. Various different ways to get it down to how do I make a decision when I'm called upon to make an ethical call right now. All right, I've gone 10 minutes over. Any questions? Sorry to go so long. Give you a lot to think about, all right? And we will pick up next week with virtue ethics. Thank you, everybody.